welcome back to Enlighten Up for episode 67, Project Stargate, Cancer Corruption, UFOs and Anal Probes, and Chemtrail History with John Mathis. We're really excited to have John join us back on the show again because he's going to pick up where he last left off. We're going to go straight into Project Stargate. We're going to talk more about remote viewing. We're going to get into the corruption of the cancer business because that's exactly what it is. It's a business and we're going to get into more detail about that. We're going to get into the history of our chemtrails. We wish Michael was on this show with us today because that would have made it a little bit more fun. Uh, but we're going to talk about that and how it all started and why there may be nefarious use. We're going to debate the effects of an individual versus a group on the collective consciousness. We're going to get into coffee karma. And of course, later on in the show, we're going to talk UFOs and anal probes. We're going to get a little bit more into detail on that little reptilian that John told us about in the last episode and how he escaped it. So let's jump right into the episode and find out what John has to share with us. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Enlighten Up. I am here with Lisa and Brian, and today we are joined by one of our fan favorite guests. His last episode with us is actually our most popular episode, and that was with John Mathis, episode 51, Shopping at the Cosmic Costco. If you don't remember, John is a spirit communicator and remote viewer, and uh According to his last show, you'll remember that he uses shock-provoking humor to tell his stories and provide us many laughs along the way. John, welcome back to the show. We're so happy to have you back. Thank you very much. Uh, Glad to be invited back. I thought maybe I scared everyone off. (laughs) (laughs) I think you may have scared Michael off. (laughs) No, Michael actually was, I think, uh, having a secret crush on you at the time. He... uh... Had never been more in love with a guest, I think. Yeah, he awesome. was pretty excited about you. Awesome. Let's see if yeah. I can repeat that. Yeah, well, let's see if you can convert Brian. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, John, last uh, that episode was so entertaining, and there was just so much information in that episode, and we really couldn't delve deep enough into some of the things that I personally wanted to learn more about, and I think a lot of our listeners would appreciate getting more of the backstory on. And um, I know that we talked about Project Stargate as um, that disinformation or I guess the, the disinformation campaign of the U.S. telling the Russians that we had psychic spies when, in fact, we didn't. And so then Russia came up with their own psychic spies and that scared the U.S. saying, oh, shoot, now we need psychic spies. Is that kind of what happened? Yeah, pretty much. You know, we we ran a a disinfo uh, uh, campaign and then they decided, to, oh, we need to do this too. Uh, And so then all of a sudden word came out that Russia is actually doing it and holy crap, it works. So then we staring at goats. Yeah, so that's a Hollywood version, and there's 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 some remote viewers revealed there. There's some remote viewers that weren't even touched upon, uh, but there's actually uh, it's it's kind of funny how it's gone through its permutations because you know the the CIA funded it, and the DIA funded it, then the Air Force funded it. Uh, and then in 95, they decided, oh, no, this doesn't work, so we're not going to fund it anymore. But it's like, So are you a government weapon? Uh, they called themselves, uh, you know, Jedi Masters. Uh, so I don't know if you want to call that a weapon or not. I guess, you know, anything could be a weapon if you, uh, you know, use it right or wrong. Can you remind us what your background is? Oh, uh, sure. How you, you know this stuff? Oh, okay. Uh, so... I had a great uncle who was actually involved in Project Blue Book, and he told me a couple of the things that, you know, he had known and experienced. And at the time I was about 11 or 12 and he was in his 70s. And, you know, I just ate that up like candy. And uh, so when I got older and was going to the library and was looking up, you know, just secret stuff, um, it always was at the back of my mind. And then when uh, you know, some books would come around my consciousness, anything that had Project Blue Book or aliens or uh, UFOs. That stuff just kind of always intrigued me. 
then once I got into uh, college and the, you know the the internet started to become available, then it was like okay, let me go search for th- some of this stuff. Um, then I have also popped into a couple of MUFON uh, gatherings. Uh, the The reason why I jumped into those is that so my background is uh, I'm a clinical research nurse, and I was looking for a paradigm that would be close to um, my own near-death experience. And the paradigm that I found was PTSD. So you, you have this uh, ordinary life. You have an extraordinary event. You do not have the uh, compensatory strategies to deal with that event. You come back looking for support and you know your your spouse your religion your friends your job none of those things offer you that um that salve of satisfaction and you find yourself looking for something to make sense of the world and so that's why you find a lot of people who go through ptsd or they've been through abduction experiences uh, or they've had a near-death experience they all kind of fit loosely into the same paradigm of I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to get divorced. I'm going to uh, find a new religion or just, you know, abdicate religion entirely. And, and, is, and, and you mentioned, you mentioned MUFON. I don't, I don't know what that is. Is that an acronym? Yeah, so it's the, uh, help me out here. Mutual something UFO network, I think. UFO. Oh, yeah. Okay. So basically, it's a place where a bunch of believers uh, gather, and it's either people who have had abductions or people who have uh, seen things that they can't explain. So they're not all abductees. Uh, so people you'll have, of Earth. I, uh, you know, I've I've had that reference before, and I've never seen that show, so I can't speak to it. Um, funny, it's a funny uh, show. Okay, I'll put that on my watch list. I'm, I'm already on a watch list, so why shouldn't I have one for myself? Uh. <laughs> so, so anyway, the, the MUFON reason was I reached out to them because it's like, I've been a near-death experiencer, and I'm also a nurse, and I understand the PTSD paradigm. Here's how I think it might help out people here. What do you think? And so I went to a couple of different MUFON groups in order to make that presentation and to see how it lined up. But in those conversations that's where I got even more uh, curious about Blue Book and you know what it was, what it really was, uh, what its uh, overt and covert purposes were. And then when I started talking with remote viewers, the remote viewers were like, yeah, originally we were tasked with stuff that were on Earth, and then we got tasked with things that were off Earth. Um, so that just kind of there's the the deeper you get into the stuff, you realize that this doesn't look like silos anymore. It's more like a a spider web. It's all interconnected. Does that help you, Brian? Yeah. I, yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Um, So getting back to project Stargate. Now you were talking about how, you know, these spies are created and I, did you see the TV? Have you seen the TV show stranger things? No. Um, Okay, so in Stranger Things, it's a great TV show. I highly suggest you watch it. You would really love it. Uh, It it takes place in the 70s and 80s um, during um, uh, um, an MKUltra program. I always forget it, and and it's always on the show that I forget the name, and I don't know why. It starts with an M. I can't think of it. Anyway. Okay, so there's a girl in there who has these psychic abilities, and she is held in. Um, she is held by the government in like a, uh, I guess, some sort of underground lab base, and they use her to do remote viewing. And I know that this was used like it looked like she was tasked to go to Russia to um, spy on enemies of the Soviet. So, you know, they're kind of prepping our consciousness with that through these TV shows. Can you go into more detail on that? 
Um, I, so I have a frame of reference. I've never seen Stranger Things, so I don't know what to. I can't pair up to that. But the whole, the whole, the whole project, Stargate, like, yeah. So, how did, like, what came of it? So it sounds like what these writers have done is that they've read some of the Stargate things, and if you go on to uh, CIA.gov and go into their Freedom of Information file, mm -hmm. uh, you can see. Uh, a lot of the remote viewing notes and things that were going on between the late seventies to early eighties. And yeah, so that was a pretty common thing uh, to uh, hop over to Russia and see what's going on. And one of the, um, the guy who uh, has been deemed the, the best of the remote viewers, uh, his name uh, is Joe McGonigal. And I've taken a couple classes from him and he teaches at the Rhine, which is here in Durham uh, on occasion. And one of the things that he was tasked to do was, you know, hey, we've seen this weird activity uh, up uh, north of the um, Arctic Circle. Can you remote view and see what's going on? And so he popped over there and he's like, yeah, I see uh, an airplane hangar, but it's the largest hangar I've ever seen. And it's halfway submerged in water. And when I go inside it, I see a submarine, but it's a submarine that's probably as big as an aircraft uh, carrier. And they immediately, you know, discarded what he had to say because that makes no sense. How do you have, uh, you know, a hangar that's underwater? And how do you have a submarine of such, you know, gigantic proportions? Um, but if you've seen the movie, Red sounds like a spaceship. Yeah, if you've seen the movie Red October, you know that there was a little bit of history tied into that. And it took them a few months with uh, conventional means to uh, get over there to see what was going on. But it turns out Joe was exactly correct. It was the largest uh, submarine that's ever been built. Uh, I think they only built one. Uh, but again, it's like, you know, Joe was able to see this thing even though they didn't believe it. Um, and one of the things that I learned from uh, reading about Project Stargate, the different readers, was that they're all influenced by their experiences, just like we all are influenced by our experiences. Uh, we may all see the same event, but we could have different interpretations. And so that's why you needed a couple of remote viewers to be tasked with the same uh, target. And after you get two or three readers looking at the same place and you find, you know, what the different uh, data points that correlate, then you kind of start to draw in a picture. So, okay, here's where I, I, what I find so interesting about this. As someone who has been called crazy for the majority of my life, uh, and especially to people who don't understand the abilities that some people have, or, or I should say everyone has, but most not everyone knows how to use them or tap into them, are these psychic abilities, like uh, visual abilities, audible abilities, um, uh, traveling like, with, through your consciousness to other areas and not with your physical body. The, I mean, if you think about the CIA came up with this whole idea of this word, the conspiracy theory as a way to make people who talk about this stuff sound crazy and have that word used by people who don't understand it or can't believe it to as a weapon against people who are maybe speaking such truths. Yet you have a government who's using these abilities to spy at the highest levels on their enemy. That I find is just very uh, interesting. I, I, I don't know why. I don't know why you would find it interesting. I mean, the 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 government or the powers that are in control have always sought systems of uh, mass control and manipulation. You know, so whether it's politics or religion or or marketing, advertising, uh, racism, whatever you can throw into the huddled masses in order to keep them confused and biting at each other then that means they're not actually paying attention to the things that are going around them uh, or maybe, you know, focusing inward 
or focusing on more spiritual or esoteric things. Um, and I, I, I found myself looking at things that were the other than. So it's like everyone was talking about Edison when I was in like fifth grade. And, you know, we're all like, oh, and here's a, our, our, you know, our eight week course on inventors. And let's talk about uh, Edison and how great and wonderful he was. And, you know, I remember that class. And then a few years later, I was hearing about this guy named Tesla. And I was like, wait a minute. I don't know anything about Tesla and, you know, the entire class was dedicated to, you know, how smart and wonderful Edison was. And then that's when I realized that history is written by the people who control the masses. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I didn't know anything about the, the, uh, the uh, Edison inventors yes. and that the, actually the carbon filament was actually discovered by a black inventor who happened to be working for Edison. And so Edison took that uh, patent and took that information and made it his own. Um, well, he had a, he had a laboratory of like 200 to 300 people. Absolutely. He was just, yeah. He, I mean, he was, he was just well positioned to, you know, take advantage of, you know, s smart people. Yeah. So he was a businessman. He was, I mean, he, he may, yeah, he may exactly. have been an inventor, uh, but that wasn't his his primary thing. His primary thing was a businessman. And if you've ever been to Fort Myers, you know that Edison lived right across the street from uh, Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been well. I, what a great parallel because they basically both did the same exactly. thing. Henry Ford used a construct, you know, uh, the 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 assembly line, and so did Thomas Edison. He used an assembly line of of brain power and came up with ideas that we yeah, needed. Ford the was time. the first to come up with a moving assembly line. That way you had a person just standing doing mm -hmm. the same widget over and over and over, as opposed to one person who can follow the vehicle from start to finish. Uh, and in a way that kind of started the silo aspect of, of intelligence. Cause the last thing you want as a businessman is having someone who knows how to build your widget from top to bottom. Uh, if you only know how to spin, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of lug nuts and, you know, hit the oil can one or two times, fine. But that means you'll never be able to, to be a competitor. Uh, and Edison did the same thing. But when I started looking at Tesla and Tesla started, you know, when he started talking about getting information from outside of himself, then that's why I was like, nah, I'm not so sure about that. And so again, started doing research back in history and it's like, wait a minute, there's a whole shit ton of people that said they got information from outside of themselves. Ben Franklin, George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, um, Tesla, um, General Norman Schwarzkopf. Uh, well, General Norman Schwarzkopf, I don't know how much of a philosopher he is. Uh, but I mean, he talked about dreaming going into Baghdad and how he would go through and, and, you know, capture the city. But then he was denied that opportunity. He says, he says he got within 90 miles of it. He could, he could actually see it through his scopes and, you know, he wasn't able to do that. But that's when I started looking back through history and it's like, okay, let's, let's find these, you know, mental giants and find out what, what were their inspiration and a lot of times you'll hear that, you know, they had a dream and they had a dream and either angels or God or a being or family or angel, whatever. Somehow there was a being that was elevated in their perception. And then that being demonstrated that and then they brought that back into reality. And so if you if you are willing to stop drinking the Kool-Aid long enough and look at the world from a 10,000 foot perspective, you can see evidence all throughout history, human history. And if we can get rid of the America, uh, the America, uh, egotism, you can see that this is part of human history. There have been people been, I mean, the Aborigines, both in uh, Africa and, uh, um, Australia were really touchstones for me. Because as I saw what they consider just, you know, daily life, we would call shamanic or witchcraft. And then if you look at the power structures and the things that keep people in control here, like the Bible, 
oh, we can't have people going and, and cons, you know, consorting with soothsayers and witches and psychics. Uh, you'll burn in hell. Okay, well, that may be true if you believe that, but it, it also is an excellent way to keep people from learning any other uh, tangent other than the one you're being fed. It's like getting a steady diet of Fox News or a steady diet of USA Today, a steady diet of Mother Jones. None of those things are a good thing. You know, you need to have a, you need to have a mixed diet. <laughs> That makes sense. So, yeah, it's, it's very important. Like in all things, you want you want balance in, in everything. And I think the more information that you can equip your mind with, the better off you are to discern what is truth for you and what isn't. And so when it comes to this whole idea of um, using your consciousness to travel to places uh, outside of your body, uh, and, and as you call it, the meat suit. Um, I think that's just so very interesting. And, and, I, and I guess we kind of do it every night in our dreams. And I know Brian is of the mindset that they're just dreams. And um, I, I think that that is partially true. Um, but it's just always interested me that people are so trusting of the government in how they believe things can actually happen. And it's just from my experience of understanding the health industry, understanding the food industry, understanding um, the medical industry. It's just that Anytime they're telling you, no, don't look there, it's probably a good idea to maybe just do some research and discover for yourself. Maybe it's not true. Maybe it is true. But I just feel like there's always some nuggets of truth hidden there. I think what you said, John, about, you know, the powers that be or whatever term you use, distracting us to keep us from really going inside ourselves or looking at what's important is just so true. The media does it you know, especially through politics and using anything we can just to create a diversion to keep us from looking at what really is true. And the end, I, I think that's kind of the meat and potatoes of it all. But the, the frosting on top of that is then to also uh, instill uh, fear-based thinking. Because, you know, if, if you are in a survival uh, moment, you know, you're not thinking about, oh, let's meditate and practice some pranayama and open up my, you know, pineal gland and all this sort of stuff. Uh, you're like, oh, shit, the house is on fire. Let me grab a fire extinguisher. Hmm. And so that's Absolutely. what all of those other things are are doing in part is fear. Uh, oh, I might go to hell if I eat fish on Friday. Oh, uh, I'm going to go to hell because I didn't, you know, face Mecca when I was praying. Uh, oh, I'm going to go to hell if, uh, you know, I have an abortion. Oh, I'm going to go. Or even the health. Yeah. I think even about the concept of hell. The con Well, even I'm thinking of the concept of, of health. Like you hear on commercials so many times about cancer and it's just like this constant message that you might get cancer you have to be really afraid of it and, and this is what we're doing and you have to take this or go here it, it's just this constant fear of you're not even in control of your own health well and so when you when you mention cancer i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna get into that with some bigger teeth um because i did cancer research for about eight years and one of the projects I worked on was to actually come up with a treatment protocol for the uh, BRCA1 uh, gene, uh, ER, HER negative gene mutation. So there, I was in it for eight years and I got out of it because I have seen so many instances where there was something promising and it was taken off the table for whatever reasons. And I finally got to the realization that there are more people living off cancer than dying from it. And that's exactly the way the pharmaceutical industry wants it. 
Um, you know, right. mm-hmm. we don't want people dying, but we also don't want people to get well. We want people to be, you know, inert users for as long as possible to keep our stock share. Absolutely. My friend recently um, was diagnosed with cancer and he was in the hospital and we were, he was telling me how just the one trip, most recent trip that he had to the hospital was over a hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, cancer is a business. Yeah. If you're, if you're making all those, all those companies making all those pills, if nobody's buying your pills, you're not making any money. Right. Well, and I used to push a medication that would stimulate bone marrow growth. And that medication was seven, seven, no, $14,000 an injection. And I was giving, um, four of them a day to certain patients. So yeah, I mean, hundred thousand is cheap. But again, I mean, I, I, I've seen, I've seen, and this is like a whole show unto itself. So I, I don't, you know, you told me to deep dive if I want to, but I'm, I'm just going to say now that we could spend an entire show on this, but there, there were medications, there were foods, there were behaviors that I had all seen where they would change the, um, the nadir value of tumor burden, or when you take an average of tumor burden, you come up with a a number and that's your nadir value. And if you can bring that up a certain percentage, it's called a partial response. If you bring it up even higher then it's a complete response. And once you get a nadir value to a certain level, you never want to see it drop down. Otherwise it means the body's kind of accommodated to whatever you're doing. And now the cancer's, you know, back on fire again. But I've Hmm. seen so many different tangents that have changed nadir value and it was on the rise and we never got the opportunity to write it out and see, do people keep getting better or do we see the nadir fall and we've got to switch, you know, uh, weapons here. And so do you, do you use your current beliefs or, and I, I don't, I don't know how long held, I mean, you talked about, you know, your, your great uncle introduced some of these ideas for you and you've done research, um, on your own. So this is a long, these are long held beliefs for you, but you also said you're a, a clinical research nurse. I mean, did that go against, I mean, you know, you, 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 you believe these things and you're doing research for, for cancer. I mean, are you able to, you know, pull out, step away from what you were doing? I mean, do you like what you do? Yes and no. Um, I don't like my industry as a whole, but it's never going to get better if people like myself don't do things to, tweak it. So, I mean, I can't change a paradigm. So, so for example, one of the things I do right now is, so I work for IBM and I work for a division of Watson health that designs clinical trial databases. And so sometimes I have clinicians ask me questions like, you know, Hey, when we're designing the page and we're collecting, um, concomitant medications that are being using during the trial, do you have any suggestions? I'm like, yeah, you definitely want to catch the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, over the counter stuff too, because there's, you know, a lot of, uh, polypharmacy and things that go on. Oh yeah. We already know that. I'm like, okay, well, have you looked into the things that are, uh, part of PRO or patient reported outcomes? And if you had asked that question five years ago, I don't think anyone would have known what that was, but, um, part of the, um, uh, Obamacare ACA, um, you have to get a certain score with patient reported outcomes. The patient actually had to enjoy their experience. And if it didn't come out with a high enough PRO (laughs) score, then the government reimburses a percentage of what your total costs were. So the hospitals are like, holy shit, not only do we have to make them well, but we also have to make them happy while they're here. (laughs) Like, well, yeah. uh, Mental health care is part of, the human experience. So yeah. Treat it. Clearly it's not part of their business model. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Holy shit. You know, they didn't teach this in business school. Um, 
<laughs> it just doesn't affect my bottom line. Yeah, exactly. Well, and now it does. And so now that it does, now, no, now it's not important. the bottom line that they care about, right? Well, and again, now it does. Yes. So, for example, if you come into the hospital with pneumonia, they send you home and you're back within X amount of time back into the hospital with pneumonia, that entire first hospitalization does not get paid for. So now they have to be really careful about we can't kick people out too soon, even though if the standard of care says you're, we're only hospitalizing you for four days. Well, if you take five days, then that's one day of cost they've got to eat. But if you discharge that person too early, then you don't get paid for those four days. So it's like, okay, well, we'll eat one day of profit so that this person does go home. We, should, we make sure we get paid. We get paid for the four days. So now, so now they throw in the PROs on top of yeah. that. So not only do you have to keep them well, they have to have enjoyed their experience. So, and it's, you know, not, you know, was it puppies and rainbows, but it's like, you know, do you feel like you were listened to? Do you feel like that you, uh, you know, pe they were paying attention to you? Uh, were all of your questions answered? So they're not really, you know, fuzzy type thing. I mean, to me, they're a standard of care that has a standard. Yeah. So that's now finding its way into clinical research because a lot of the times we're pulling data from clinical records. And so sometimes the, the clinical trial paradigm reaches into medicine itself and that standard of care. So if I need an x-ray for a clinical trial, that x-ray gets paid for either by the insurance company or by the pharmaceutical company. And the pharmaceutical company is going to say, well, let's see if we get insurance to pay for it first. So there is that cross pollination. And I think that's why we saw patient reported outcomes start to show into clinical trials. So now what I've. So basically you're using your, the other side of you that sees the bigger picture to help make your industry better. Right. And the way I'm doing that is like, so in the concomitant medications, you're already asking about their meds. You're already asking about their OTC. Have you asked them about their PROs? Some of them are, and some of them aren't. And I'm like, well, if you're asking about their PROs, you need to ask if they're doing anything, you know, um, complimentary. Well, what do you mean complimentary? I said, well, some hospital systems are doing Reiki. Oh, yeah. Some hospital systems are also doing aromatherapy or essential oils. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, the hospital I came from in Florida, they did all those things. Plus, they had an acupuncturist on staff. Really? Yeah. I said, you know, you might start investigating in healthcare and see that there are some things going on that are going to affect your clinical outcome because the patient believed it so. Or there might be a therapeutic uh, polypharmacy going on. Uh, lavender, lavender is high in, in phytoestrogens. And so if you have a lot of estrogens on board, maybe your medication is going to respond to the fact that there's extra free estrogen floating around this person's body. Oh, so I'm coming at a science approach to these folks, but what I'm actually doing is I'm teaching our artificial intelligence that we need to ask questions beyond what medications and what OTCs are you taking? Because mm -hmm. I mean, on, most people these days are are using many more um, alternatives in conjunction with what they're being given. They are, but it's not quote unquote standard of care, and it's not getting paid for by insurance companies. So a lot of times it just falls off the radar. But if I can get clinical trials to start asking questions along the lines of complementary and alternative medicine, and it becomes a factor in the algorithm that Watson uses to come up with a patient treatment, then perhaps down the road, someone's going to say, hey, I've got this kind of cancer. What do you think? I don't know. Let's see what Watson says. Do, 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 do. Okay. So here's the medicine. Here's the OTC. Here's the meal. And here's the complementary medicine suggestions that came out. Right. You know, what, what's, what's interesting about complementary, you know, medicines or approaches or alternative approaches, Lisa's friend who, who, uh, who is fighting cancer right now, we, uh, arranged for him to, to get Keef mm -hmm. pills. Um, and you know, if, if his cancer is beaten, you don't know what beat the cancer. 
because he's he's not stopping his traditional, uh, you know, Mr. chemo yeah, and yeah, ra- radiation or, or whatever. But he's also taking Keef. So. I wouldn't advocate you know him There's, getting rid of the the natural thing. You know, throw the kitchen sink at it. And at the end of the day, if right. he's well, who gives a shit how he got well? Right. Well, I, I I guess the the reason I was saying it is if if clinical studies don't look at the whole thing, you can't. How can you know? But you know, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the the alternative methods don't go through clinical studies. Only the the medicines go through the clinical trials and studies. So you don't see people that are using Keef pills. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is on the side, under the radar. Don't tell anybody because it may or may not be legal. And it may be the best approach, but there's no clinical trials to, to, to support it. I, my, my uh, sister-in-law, she studies, she, she's also in the, in, you know, in the, in the cancer, in the cancer field. Um, and, we were talking about hemp and the benefits of CBD and Keef. And she said, when it's legal, I'll be one of the first pe- people to, to study it. But, you know, because her school that she works at is, you know, receives federal funds, they can't touch it. And it's, it's just unfortunate. The whole system's broken. It is broken. And so it's kind of like you get to the question of, you know, do you hate the player or hate the game? Um, I, so I, I, hmm, judiciously, I will answer. There are things that I have done that helped people with their healthcare crisis that if it were fully disclosed, I would lose my nursing license. Hmm. Good for you. But it comes down to the question of what is morally right versus what is legally right. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. if you look across the country, we are having that discussion and it seems to me that we're begrudgingly coming closer to that morally right. You know, if I have a child in front of me who is two years old and suffering 30 drop seizures a day and I can take some marijuana chop it up put it into some melted butter freeze it up again so that they've got some compound butter for his toast and he ends up having two drop seizures a week then where where do you fall on that is that illegal depends on what state you're in Mm -hmm. and i personally have a problem with letting the the government decide whether or not this child can have a positive quality of life because of their fear-based thinking and because of their willingness to abdicate health for control. Well, and they've, and they've demonstrated their, their inability to, I mean that, you know, that they're, they're hiding so much from us. And then, you know, in some things they're, you know, they're so out front and outspoken about certain things and not outspoken about other things and, you know, covering up and hiding and open. I mean, it's just like, good gracious. You just can't keep up with them. It's like, they're trying to fool you. Like they're really upfront about certain things just to make it. You think that, see, we're looking into this stuff. You know, we care. Well, they've known marijuana had medicinal purposes as long as back as the fifties. But they also kept it a Schedule One narcotic so that we couldn't have access to it. But now that there's been this tidal wave of, of proof and evidence, uh, they're realizing that they don't have the moral high ground that they you know, had back in the 50s and 60s. And so that's why we're seeing... But they still have the legal high ground, unfortunately. Right, and, and in most places. So you know, one, one of my investments is in the marijuana industry. And so I have a superfluous knowledge of, of some of that. And one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm paying attention to is the individual state's response versus Canada's response versus our response as a federal government. <coughs> and the government is hedging its bets. I mean, 
for example, if if I if I have a, a institution in in uh, Colorado, I can't invest any of my money in the banking system uh, because then it's subject to federal seizure. So these That's people right. are going through and they're buying vaults out of banks that have you know didn't survive their stress test, and they're just there's they're putting vaults in these you know WalMarts or these Kmart's that they've taken over. And they're just stuffing cash in there. And so now what you're finding is there's this new industry where basically <clears throat> investment groups are taking that money, investing it in other things in their portfolio that are legal, and then bringing those returns back to the industry. So it's like, oh, so we're now officially laundering money, but we're doing it legally. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I, every, mm-hmm. every time it comes up for vote, more and more states are opting into it. And as soon as they realize that they can tax this and derive a huge amount of income from it, they'll come around. But one of the things I've seen in the, the, the news, uh, in the industry magazines is they're trying to keep people, individuals to growing, um, I think is a hundred plants is the maximum you can grow. And if the, Not personally. I mean, Colorado, you can have five plants is it personally. Five? And Maybe individual. it was a, his company. Yep. Somewhere I was reading that there was 100 was like the limit. But then they had people like Bear and Monsanto and DuPont. And they're getting into it now. And it's like when we, <coughs> we start seeing big names like that getting in, involved in it, then you know the federal government's going to flip. Because the people that basically pay the federal government they're now interested and they now mm-hmm. see the money potential. Um, Corona. Yeah, but that's also when I, I imagine it falling apart because they're going to do, you know, the fake drug version, which they tried to do in the 70s. You know, when they when they started to understand the endocannabinoid system, they tried to, my understanding is that the, the drug companies tried to create uh, synthetic mm-hmm. cannabinoids, mm-hmm. CBD, um, and it didn't work. It did not have the the effect on the body that natural cannabinoids did. So that's so. two different answers. It didn't work, and it didn't have the same effect. So it 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 did work, <coughs> but it did not have the same therapeutic response as the nature derived. Right. And that doesn't mean that the pharmaceutical industry still won't take it and still won't run with it. Uh, oh, sure, sure. They'll they'll put something out there, you know, and they'll say, oh, this is, you know, they'll be able to spin it because they have billions of dollars and they can have, you know, commercials and they'll say this yep, is the safe yep. version and, yep. it's, and it's not going to work or it's not going to work as well. Well, it's just like with, um, just like with, uh, Amazon buying out Whole Foods, you know, you get these massive companies who, who literally, you know, have no interest in your well-being, and buying out like, the, like a company like Whole Foods, which had already been like transitioning out of what it had started off as. And, and now you can almost be certain that I would question every food product that's in Whole Foods going there. Like, is their produce really organic? Like, I don't know. I know they've got the stickers on there, but I also know how easy it is to put an organic sticker on food. And it's just, you start to question the, um, the ethics and, and the morals behind the companies when you have companies like Monsanto or DuPont getting involved and what that actually means for the product that you're now going to be consuming. So, um, yeah, a, a, an example that I have is, um, you know, we're coming up on cold and flu season, so the, the run for Tamiflu is about to begin. The first year Tamiflu was out on the market, it was actually derived from the uh, molecule that's found in the spice uh, star anise. So my advice is, is that if you can tolerate a licorice-flavored tea, go get some star anise and have that in your cabinet and be drinking that during cold and flu season. There you go. Because the first year they couldn't get it ready for, um, they couldn't get it ready for market, but they were already at the chemist bench trying to tear apart the molecule and re-engineer it. 
so the first year, Tamiflu was actually derived from star anise. Hmm. But by the time the second year came out, they were able to have already had that molecule part back together again, had it patented, and now it was new and improved. Right. What about the fact that they're spreading the flu through chemtrails and things okay. like that? Okay. That is Let's a great segue there. because, <laughs> yes, no, I actually- I mean, is I it was... really flu season or, you know, <laughs> this is just an industry. So let's make people believe this is the time of year everybody gets sick and it's this programming that we believe, oh no, we need the flu shot. Oh no, we need all this stuff. It's flu season and it's just a belief. Okay. So I'm glad you brought that up because I really wanted to transition into that. John, you talked about your great uncle working for Project Blue Book and on our last show when you were with us, you mentioned, which drove Michael nuts, uh, that your great uncle had downloaded what chemtrails actually were and that they are real, but that they're not what we think they are. Are you sure that was me? So what's, yeah, I, I mean, I just listened to it before we started the show because I wanted to make sure I had the information correct. Well, uh, so the chem... Are you not supposed to talk about it? <laughs> like, or... Well, I, I don't remember the information coming from my great uncle, but so my, my fam my family is predominantly uh, firemen, military, uh, and healthcare. And so there's a lot of crosstalk and there. So I know, I know someone who flies a uh, airplane that is KC-135. It's basically a flying gas can in the sky. And they weren't always flying gasoline. And there has been a couple of things out there in the ether that you can find on the internet um, for example, there is a air force document that's out there. Just type in air force. We, we will own the weather. <clears throat> and there was, um, a debate, I think, well, not a debate. There was a paper that was uh, generated in the mid nineties that basically said by 2025, we will own the weather. And in, um, Vietnam, during Vietnam, we were already seeding the skies with uh, different materials to change the weather, to manipulate the weather. Uh, I mean, I think we can go back even to uh, World War II. I remember reading somewhere that they were actually dumping um, aluminum chaff into the skies just to mess with the radar. So, you know, we, we've been chucking stuff into the skies since at least the 50s. Uh, so anyone who says chemtrails don't exist, aren't paying attention. Yeah, but it, 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 based on what you just said as an insider, and, and I think this is what I don't get the sense from Nicole, because she finds this to be very nefarious based on what you just said, this is done to control the weather. And that any consequences to us on the ground, which it sounds like is a reality, you dump something in the air, it's going to make it down on the ground, but that wasn't the intent. The intent wasn't to give everybody the flu. The intent was to own the weather. Yeah. So for example, when, when, uh, <clears throat> when we were, and again, this is something I've read, so I don't know how much this is true. But what I read was that there were actually CIA planes dumping chemicals into the air that would stimulate rain response. And they were doing this over Laos and Cambodia because the North Vietnamese were drifting up into those areas because we wouldn't go there. And then they would come back out after they had, you know, had some rest and, and resupply. And so to hamper them doing that, but without having, you know, boots on the ground uh, legally, um, then, yeah, so that's what they were trying to manipulate them through psyops as well as trying to manipulate the weather. But, you know, a hammer is a hammer until you decide to kill someone with it and then it's a weapon. So, you know, it depends upon who's flying the plane. I may be trying to drive 
rain over areas that are parched to try to save crops. Or I may be dropping, you know, a virus that is going to inspire an illness just to see what happens. And that's, all, that's also something that I've seen is that I've read where they've done very limited supply of our um, projects. They will drop something that's like a cold over a, a metropolitan area. And the test was, how will people respond to a pandemic? You know, who gets called? How do they behave? Where do they go? What's the vector pattern? So that if something like, I don't know, Zika decided to find its way into, I don't know, Miami, how will people respond? What is, what is the stress load going to be? How will people behave? Now, is that something that is a white hat thing because they want to be able to have FEMA, you know, trailers and things in place so that if it does happen, they're appropriately staged? Or is it a black hat thing where it's like, you know, if, if there's a certain group of people that we don't like and they cluster in a certain area, then we know we can dump here. We also know to turn off the phone lines and to change the stoplights to make sure we control and keep them in a certain area. You know, like I said. Or is it a way just to, to continually control the masses through fear to keep people afraid and keep them in fear of their own health and drive them to the flu vaccination and all these other things? Is it just a control and money-making industry? A hammer is a hammer until you use it as a weapon. I think all these things are possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these things are narratives that could be true. I don't think we should be naive. I mean, when you have the wrong... Isn't happening or couldn't be happening. Yeah, when you have the wrong people in power, the, the power gets abused. So, of course, you can take any tool that could be used for good and use it for uh, nefarious purposes. Okay, so now that we're in this mindset, let me spin you 180 degrees. Now, remember, you told me you told me I could take off the training wheels, right, Nicole? Go for it. Yes, okay. please. So now let's jump into out of the physical reality and let's go into mental or consciousness reality. Okay. So we are energetic beings of infinite lifespan and we have temporarily stepped into our respective meat suits. But when we die, our consciousness doesn't die. We go back to wherever to, you know, control out, delete and, and do it again. If we are energy that have temporarily slowed down into physicality and we're going to go back into energy and we've been doing this bouncing back and forth two, three, four thousand times, maybe. Um, if we are energy, which I think we are, and if Einstein's theory of uh, quantum entanglement, that spooky action at a distance, is also true, which I believe it is, then that means that we are still affecting the energetic space that we were in before we stepped into our meat suit. So we still have that quantum entanglement. So as I start thinking or transmitting or sitting at the uh, drive through window speaker of the universe and place my order, what's going to start happening to that energy that I am still entangled with? What is it going to start doing? It's going to start manifesting. So that whole thing of whether you want to call it the secret or meditation or whatever, I believe that is the science side of the woo-woo in the sense that because I'm still connected energetically to the universe, which I consider the universe as potential, we can make anything out of energy because energy is matter 
but it requires focused entrainment. So if I want to focus on, I want to create a chaotic environment. And if I can find enough people who believe what I believe so that we can focus on all that. Now we've entrained all our collective minds here, connecting to that energy field of potential. What are we then going to manifest? And it gets back to that axiom as above, so below. So are you, are you, are you, I, I think I'm following here, you here. So are you trying to say uh, on the flip side of what we're talking about with chemtrails, that as long as you continually have it in your belief system, that they exist, they will. Yes. Is that where you're going with this? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> I want so, to make sure I'm following. So, I, I, so what I believe is that we can work as hard as we want here in the physical plane to change the system and environment. But if there are enough minds that are entrained to perpetuate that system, then we're not going to succeed. Conversely, if we have a group of people who are sitting on a holy mountain and their only purpose is to connect to that entrainment and change that physical reality, there are still enough people here in the physical reality that are perpetuating that paradigm. And so you may see a modicum of change, but you won't see quote unquote real change. Can an individual. I'm so glad you went there. Them. I was hoping someone well, would you know, go what, there. What it, what, it <laughs> ma- what it makes me, what it makes me think is, okay, if, if, and let's say there's some, you know, nefarious purpose out there and, you know, so let's call it a government and they've got, you know, a lot of people and they're putting this mental thought into keeping this, let's, let's call it cancer, you know, putting all this energy out there to keep this thing called cancer, you know, af- af- affecting humanity. If I, as an individual, you know, remove myself from that manifest a different way, does that protect me from that, that bigger energy flow or, does it matter what the individual does as long as there's more people doing the other thing? Does that make sense? Um, so uh, from a philosophical point of view, I'm going to say it does matter what a person does. It does matter what you think. And I wouldn't deter anyone from taking that uh, perspective and acting on it. But if you want to look at it from, I don't know, from a, I don't know, mathematical point of view, I don't think one person is enough. I think that it takes a collective again to have that entrainment that synchronizes, reaches out to the potential that we're still connected to and then make manifest in this reality. Okay. So I'm going to challenge you there, Mr. Mathis. Um, I hope you from do. What I, got several, I got several things to tell you about that, how it works. So from now, now, I don't fully disagree with what you were saying. However, I don't like to minimize the individual effect that is had on the collective. If the person is at a um, high enough frequency to affect that sort of change. From what I understand, um, from the author of um, Power Versus Force, uh, Hawkins, he has outlined this uh, grid of consciousness starting from, well, there's death, which there's no energy, and then shame, which is the lowest level of frequency. And you go through all the different emotions or feelings. And so you have fear sitting at 100. And then you hit 200, which is a, was the first baseline. 200 is courage. And as soon as you hit courage, that's where you move from a destructive level of consciousness into a constructive level of consciousness. Now, when you move into a constructive level of consciousness, you now are able to, as one person, begin affecting individuals in that lower frame, below 200, in a very positive way. So as you go up the scale and you hit 
Um, the next major baseline is love. That's where you make a huge leap, which is 500. You are affecting a huge amount of people. I believe at love, it's 750,000 people. You as one person can, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Neutralize the negativity of 750,000 people in the lower frequency phases. Wow. When you get to the stage of enlightenment, which is considered to be Jesus, Buddha, and all of that, that's level 1,000. You have the ability to neutralize the negativity of 70 million people. That's a huge wow. Uh, wow. effect. So I do believe that for this planet, it's going to require a collective, not just one individual. But I always hate to minimize the potential of what that each of us have on neutralizing the negativity here on the planet. Well... So I just want to throw that out to you, Mathis, and, 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 and please, like... Tell me if I'm. <laughs> tell me what your thoughts are on that. That's I'm curious to know because that's from what I had, I've understood for the last twenty years. Because this book was given to me when I was twenty-one. Okay, Frolic, I shall accept your challenge. <laughs> Please uh, do. So, I can only speak with authority from my own experience, and I can tell you that uh, as an abused kid, I probably was at a pretty low energetic level. Uh, having had a near-death experience and astral projection and practicing Reiki, I think I have brought my energy up to, I would say, whatever it was, above 200 to have uh, a more positive than a negative outlook. Uh, but I can also tell you love. that every time I treated a patient, I treated them with love and care and concern. Uh, I also have a skin cream that I make for people who are in outpatient radiation therapy. Uh, I also participated in the clinical paradigm of trying to find cures for cancer. And, you know, I saw some things that were promising that were taken away from me. I also saw some things that were promising that weren't taken away from me. And I was able to, to, you know, keep pushing forward. And in the process of, you know, eight years working in this paradigm, I did not see any improvement. So I think that, again, I don't want to, uh, like you, I don't want to diminish an individual's free will because I think that they can have a localized effect. I mean, like if you're in a happy mood and you're, you know, your roommate comes in and they're in a shit mood, um, there's going to be uh, a meeting and, you know, that 200 and that 100 may meet and, you know, who knows, you know, maybe the 100 goes up to 200, uh, maybe the 200 goes down to 100, maybe you meet in the middle. I, I don't know. There's a lot of dynamics going on there. But what I can tell you is that, again, all the readings that I've done talk about that if you get into a circle and you get a few people working on a project and focused on that project, that it does affect an exponentially larger number of folks. And most recently, there was a book brought out by Lynn McTaggart, uh, who did the intention experiment. Uh, she also wrote a book recently, I think it came out last year, it was called The Power of Eight. And essentially, it was she noticed this effect that, wow, if you get all these meditators to work on certain projects, we see an efficacy you go back into the 70s, there was a lot of experiments either through the Silva uh, Institute uh, or uh, some TM groups. But one of the things they noticed is that in Washington, D.C., when the weather uh, got above a certain temperature, that there was a spike in crime. And so it was like, well, we're not going to try to affect the weather, but let's try to affect that, that energy of that anger. And so a group of like, I don't know, it was like 40, 60 people. Uh, all agreed to meditate and have this loving kind of um, experience or this envelope of love over the Washington, D.C. area. And sure enough, when the temperature got to a certain point and everything had showed, that, okay, there's going to be a spike, there wasn't. And there was a residual effect because after the people stopped meditating, 
that effect continued for a certain amount of time. And I'm sorry, I haven't read it in a few years, so I don't have full recall of it. But you know, I know that the Silva uh, group has done it uh, a few times, and, and they've done it in a couple of different capacities. Another capacity they did is in the Philadelphia school systems. They found a school that had the lowest matriculation rate. They went in there and meditated and taught the kids how to meditate. And not only did they go from the lowest in the city uh, for graduation rate, they went to the highest. And then after they stopped the project, it, it continued for four or five years because uh, the kids taught the younger kids, and they also thought that the area of the school itself, the energy around the school itself, had actually changed. So the the long answer to your question is, I, I agree with you in theory, but I also think that if you want to have permanent, lasting change, it has to be, as a group, and Lynn, Lynn McTaggart says that number is eight. But I believe the more mm-hmm. people you can get synchronized to doing a certain thing and focused on that, then the more powerful that response. And you can measure power by either how quickly that effect occurs or how long lasting that effect occurs. Okay. So I'm going to continue to challenge you. Um Now, I absolutely agree with you that the more people that you have working on this, the better the results. I think that's just common sense when you look at numbers and and, and, and all that. Now, you and I have had a private conversation Uh about love. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Now, before I get into that, when... You talked about, you know, how you created all these creams and you treated people with care and, and you had the best intentions for them and all that. That I'm not going to contest. I don't, you know, I, I, from what I've known of you and the conversations that we have, I feel that and I know you're a good person and good heart and you have the betterment of humanity as part of your, your value system. Here comes the butt. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. When it comes to maintaining a frequency, it's not a simple matter of, and you just said this with Lynn Mattaggart and this idea of eight, um, it's not a simple matter of you get there and then you hold it forever. It takes training. It takes work. It takes, uh, before it becomes almost instinctual, you have to repeat it over and over and over and over, right, with anything in our lives. So mm-hmm. that idea that you explained that this med- this meditative effect on the weather or sorry, on the anger of people when it got hot was even though they'd stopped, there was still a lasting effect up until a certain point and then it started to fade away. That is like our metabolism in our body. You know, you can train your metabolism to um, to burn at a very efficient rate. And there are certain ways to train your body that will have a much longer lasting effect on your metabolism, staying high burning for a longer period of time versus it stops as soon as you start, stop working out. So there are certain ways that we can train our frequency to be long lasting. I just feel like perhaps most of us haven't figured that out yet. When I think back to a time where when I was in the Costa Rican jungle meditating in silence for 10 days, there was a period where I had, and I spoke about this on the show, two hours of absolute peace. It's where I literally, for probably the only two hours of my entire existence here on this planet in this lifetime, have experienced peace to the level that I believe has been spoken to us through um, books such as like about the Buddha and, and all of that. Like I, I just was at so much contentment and peace. I was outside of my body. I wasn't in my body anymore. I just felt like energy and I was never, I didn't want to change anything. Peace, according to the scale is 600, which is just below enlightenment. And that you have the ability of affecting 10 million people in a positive way. So for two hours, according to the scale, if I had indeed reached that level of frequency, which I felt like I did, Um, because I've never experienced it ever again, I would have the effect for two hours of shifting the uh, frequency from a negative uh, frequency into a positive one on 10 million people just for me being in that state. However, it's powerful. It's very powerful. However, obviously I came out of that state and as time would go on, that would reduce if I didn't try to get back to that state. So I feel like there is... um, 
you know, this, it's, it's, when we think, when we talk about like, oh, it, it sounds like good in theory for one individual to have that effect, but you need more people. It's like, well, maybe you just need every individual training themselves to get to that point of holding the frequency in a much more consistent way so that we have that positive effect. Now, the interesting thing, which I'm going to get to when you talked about love, is that most of us, you know, believe that we're doing things in loving ways because we've been, this idea of love has been so corrupted within our society of what love actually is. And we've had multiple conversations on this podcast about it that we don't also take into account the subconscious programming in the background of all the fears that are maybe overriding that love. So when you're not in a meditative state where you're letting all that programming go or you're paying attention to it and you recognize it, when you're helping these people, there could be programming in you, uh, like with all of us, that you've got these fears that maybe the creams won't work or maybe it's just not enough time. Or there's, I mean, there's so many different programs that could be running in our background that could be affecting the outcome of what you're trying to do. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to add more depth to so it. So basically you think you're in the state of love, but you're really in acting well, out of no, fear? Well, no, I believe he, he was in a state of love. But then we think about, you know, we've had this guest on, Jessica Alstrom, and, and Lisa, you know, we've been looking a lot into her videos and understanding the programming of the subconscious and how sometimes that programming can override the good things that we're trying to do if we're not aware uh, of what's going okay. on. All right. Do you understand now what I'm saying? Now I got it. Now I got it. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, so in the past three weeks, I have not made any cream. But in the past three weeks, I've also been working about 60 hours a week. And I was... And you haven't had time? Is that your no, excuse? No, 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 no. Well, I mean, that, I mean, that is literally true. No, I'm, I'm joking I'm with I'm also you. serious by, by saying I was not in an energetic state where I would even touch the cream. Because I, I basically, I said to a sponsor, Hey, it's going to take me X amount of time to do something. And they said, okay. And then halfway through baking the cake, they changed the recipe on me and I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to change the recipe, but you're also going to have to accept the fact that it's going to take me another two weeks. Oh no, no, no. Our contract says that it takes this much time. And so that's how much time you're going to take. So long story short, working a lot of extra hours to meet that timeline. And so in the background, I'm like, how stupid can you be to hand someone a set of blueprints, get them started, and then hand them another set of blueprints and say, your time frame doesn't change, even though I've changed the parameters. Uh, and so there was that frustration of their, you know, uh, deliberate ob deliberately being obtuse because it benefited them. And so it, what I was doing was programming, but the undercurrent was you guys are assholes. <laughs> Fair enough. And so there, there, there wasn't, there wasn't that place for me to be where I would do this. So the creams I, I have, I have a ritual and I think maybe that's the reason why we have rituals uh, to a certain extent. But I had to be, I have to be in a certain mindset or a frame of mind in order for me to do these things and appreciate them. Uh, so, you know, the Reiki has to be on, there has to be some good music on in the background. Uh, I've, you know, uh, lit some incense and I've invited in, you know, certain entities and things that, you know, help me get my mojo going. And so before I even crack a lid, on the physical stuff. I've created a space where it's like, mm, I got all the juices going. Let's make this shit happen. You know? Uh, and I, I know that it is a state that I can create, but I also know that in the whole dynamic, that is this meat suits reality. I cannot sustain that. And I think 
it comes down to that that uh, saying that it's easy to be a holy man when you're sitting on top of a mountain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I would think just the converse is, is true as well. You know, if you're a, a single mom, soccer mom, you got three kids, they've all got to be different places at the very same time on the very same day. And, you know, the inside of your car looks like it's, you know, a, a potpourri of, of uh, uh, drive through bags of differing ages. You know, sometimes that is the reality, but it doesn't mean it needs to be your permanent reality. So I think, I think you may have been at a 600. Uh, and if you affected that 10 million people, tell me which 10 million people did you affect and what effect did you have? Well, obviously, there's no way of me being able to, to prove that or to tell you who they are. It's not like I remote viewed or, or tapped into everyone's consciousness. I'm simply sharing the information that I've learned through this book and and other books that I've understood to, which resonate with me. It feels like truth to me. Uh, And that's all I'm really going on. Now, going to what you said, though, about this idea of sitting on top of a mountain, that it's a lot easier to be at peace and and have this effect if you were just sitting on a mountain and that's all you did all day, sure. But, you know, the same goes for life. If I were to come over to your house and only stock your fridge with the healthiest food possible, made sure you had a trainer to be with you, a chef that would cook your food and every possible thing that to make your life healthy, you would be most likely to succeed. But again, that's, that's like putting like, that's like the choice that the man has sitting on the mountain. But the reality is, is that we have to work to train ourselves. And it's really easy to say, well, life just isn't isn't great around me, and so I get pulled into the 3D life construct. Yes, it's true that happens, but that's also for me um, an excuse. So hmm. I think you know when I look back at my uh, journey, it's been 20 plus years. And I've gotten better at it along the way because I've been working at it. And just like you and just like Lisa and, and Brian as well, whether he believes that or not, um, you know, we're all working at it. The only way it gets stronger is the more effort we put into it. And that includes in our day-to-day life when things seem really shit. I think this is where we'll have to agree to disagree. Because as, as much energy as I put into a system, I don't have a control over all of the variables. And so as much energy I put into a system, there are other things out there that are just as energetic and they're trying to do the exact opposite of what I'm trying to do. But you're looking at the whole system. I mean, you clearly can have an impact, you know, maybe you'll, you won't change the whole system and maybe you won't be able to eradicate cancer just with your vibration and the love that you're spreading, but you are having an impact on people. You're having an impact on trials and, and different situations that you can't even measure. You don't even really know. Maybe those clinicians that asked you questions and you posed you know, um, challenging questions to them about where they should look. Maybe you've changed their lives in a way that you have, you will never know because they're now looking at things differently. That's one of the, so I think that we we're judged. You can judge too much because you're saying, well, I didn't have an impact. Not everything's changed, but maybe you really, you are changing. So one of the things they teach us in nursing is you have to have evidence-based practice. You don't do a thing until you can prove a thing. But I also have lived long enough to know that you can do a thing and have a a desired outcome and you have no idea how it happened. It's like Reiki. I I, I have an idea how Reiki works, but I, I can't tell you with any degree of confidence that that's how it works. But I can tell you it works. So the the approach that I have with evidence-based practice is only the scope is only so large. Um, so I know that I'm having some effect on things like, for example, 
Um, one of the times I, so one time I got a pretty decent um, raise at work or uh, an annual, uh, a bonus, a, a season bonus. And I wasn't anticipating this. And it was like, awesome. And so one of the things I did with it is I went to a cashier at Starbucks and I said, hey, I want a hundred dollar gift card. And she's like, okay. And so she gave me the card and I handed it right back to her. And she kind of looked at me kind of really confused. I said, you got a bunch of regulars that come in here, right? She's like, well, yeah. I said, and so you know something about their backstory. You know something, you know, whether they're having a good day or a bad day, right? Yeah. I said, fine. I said, the next time someone comes in and they're having a bad day, I want you to give them whatever they ask for, but give it to them free. And if they ask why, tell them it was a gift and that they should go pay it forward. Now, I've done that a couple of times, but on this particular occasion, I, I asked the, the barista, I said, you can't tell who it came from, but I want to sit here and just kind of watch. And she was like, oh, okay, that's fine. So, of course, there was the, the talk amongst the baristas about, you know, hey, guess what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. But it was really humbling and fun and, and amusing uh, to see people's responses to this. And sometimes it was just like, oh, okay, cool. And others, it really had a profound effect on their day. I mean, you just totally saw. I mean, I literally watched one lady's posture. Get, she got taller. <laughs> it's just like you talk about a burden being lifted. Holy cow. And so it was one of those situations where I had done something I had done before, but I didn't stick around to see the outcome. I just had to take a leap of faith, just like in nursing. You know, I can teach someone how to do something. I can give them medicine and dietary and life changes. But in the end, I have to surrender the outcome. And maybe I'll see that heart transplant patient in a McDonald's, you know, getting their fries and, and chicken McNuggets, or I may see them running a marathon. Who knows? I did my part and then I have to surrender the outcome. And so the same thing with the card at Starbucks and the same thing with the skin cream. I do believe I'm, I'm having a positive impact. Therefore I am having a positive impact, but to what degree? I don't know. And can, is it measurable? Is it repeatable? Can I quantify it, put it into a paper and have other people do the same thing and make it repeatable? Probably not. Just like Nicole. But does that mean it's not worth doing? Tell if her level of peace exactly. had any impact really on anyone. But you, you know, there's you have to have that faith and that belief that what you're doing is impactful. And I, I personally believe that's the most important part of it. And I, and I think there's also a difference in how I perceive the world and how Nicole perceives the world. And I also believe that I have more demons to wrestle. I believe we probably had the same demons to wrestle, but she's found some sort of a leg hold Kung Fu meditation <laughs> nut job that I have not discovered yet. Oh man. And that's just part of my process in this meat suit. Uh, and again, so, I mean, I, I think I've said this before. So, I mean, I grew up an abused child. And so one of the things that we see from those people is they always, not always, most people who have this background are people pleasers and they try to find a way to make everyone happy. And so the way I have permutated this is that I can't make everyone happy, but I can make good stuff. And so whether that's a cream, a clinical study, a gift card, um, a book about bullying, I can take my experiences, add in the metaphysical smorgasbord <laughs> that I've collected over the past 45 years. And the finished product is something that is helpful and can serve others. But in my process, there are going to be days where I just wake up and it's feel, I feel like I've been run over by, you know, a, a manure spreader. 
And sometimes those are the days I know that, you know what, all I've got to do today is get up and go to work. And that cream day may be later. Writing a book day may be later. Those days will come. But right here, right now, I'm, I'm not going to be the holy man on the mountain. So, okay. Let, I <laughs> didn't. Why, you have I to make sure, see you, how you perceive You make sure you keep that sigh of exasperation in the final recording. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't edit any of this out. But, big, okay, I'm not trying to say that None of us are human and none of us have really shitty days. And trust me, Lisa and I have had our fair share over the last month where, you know, she doesn't want to speak to me and I don't want to speak to her because I know one of us is going to bring us out of our funk and neither of us wants to be brought out of our funk because we're just happy to be in that shitty place uh, for that time period. I'm not. That just makes a lot of sense. <laughs> we're not really happy to be in the <laughs> shitty place. It's just, it's almost like embarrassing yeah. you're in such a shitty place when you know the other one's just gonna bring you out and then you're like yeah what the fuck yeah I exactly do? <laughs> and so i know okay i'm not saying life doesn't happen and that everyone should just be skipping through life like it's rainbows and uh rose petals everywhere but just like with anything as we get better at something we jump up a new level and now we have to get better at that and, and so as we go through this idea of raising our frequency and moving into more of a loving state of mind versus the fear-based state of mind that we've all been programmed through to be in, uh, that it's, you know, it just takes more effort. And so we're going to come up against challenges in our life, whether it's with our job or with being like what you said with this project that you've been given and then they just change the parameters on you but expect the same results in the same time frame. Yeah, that's a really shitty thing. And, you know, all of that stuff happens, but we handle it differently as we get on through life and we practice and we become better at it. That's what I was just trying to say is that instead of just saying, well, life just is always going to be shitty in certain areas, so there's only so much I can do. I like to look at it as in, I'm just going to keep getting stronger and stronger so that every time something gets thrown at me, it may even be harder than I've ever felt, but hopefully I'll handle it better this time and I'll be able to come at it with a different energy. And sometimes you don't, that's just part of being human. So I'm not, I wasn't trying to say to you that, you know, you're, you're lazy or, you know, that, you know, you, I wasn't trying to say that or anything like that, but I just think it's important for us to remember that with anything it, that's good and worth having, it takes effort and, and dedication and perseverance. So you're saying that the response I had during that teleconference of, uh, go fuck all y'all. That wasn't a right response. Wait, wait. Oh, uh -oh. Nicole, are you there? We lost Nicole. She supercharged herself now. and completely discombobulated her computer. We'll be back after this important She'll announcement. She'll be back. Is John there? Yeah, he's still here. here he's I not talking you, to you, though. Uh, here, I, Yeah, here I thought you ascended on us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what she, happened? She achieved enlightenment as we were, as we were recording. Yeah, she achieved oh. enlightenment, and I said, "I'll oh, fuck all y'all," you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, the, the whole recording just dropped there, and I'm like, "Finish what I was saying," and I'm like, "Hello, hello." <laughs> yeah, so pick up where you left Your off. Your recording Nicole. sounds better. Oh, does what? it? I'm, I'm going to drop off the line here for like thirty. I know I'm going to drop off. I'm going to put my headphones down for thirty seconds so I can close the door where I'm still hearing the hum from my neighbor who won't wake up. Okay. Oh, we okay. Don't okay. Okay. So let's talk about UFOs and anal probes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, let's because I wanted to. <laughs> I, I wanted to. I wanted to talk about anal probes. No, I actually wanted to talk about what you said at the beginning um, about this idea that we can go through the sun, but uh, negative other entities prefer to go around it. What were you meaning about like, by that? Um, just if, well, this is like going from 100 level to like 400 level classes here. Um, well, and, and I'm, I want to interrupt just for a sec because I think I'm not that familiar with remote viewing. I know I have an idea of, of what it is and I can imagine it, but I 
would think that some of our listeners really don't understand what remote viewing is. So you might want to just. I'll do a very, I'll do a very brief summary. Yeah, do a brief summary. So there is this large umbrella called out of body experiences. And if you can imagine it like being a step ladder, uh, being awake is like the first rung. Uh, to be in like a dreamy state and be suggestive, that would be the next rung. And then to be in a place where uh, you're no longer aware of the outside world, but you're not truly REM sleeping, that would be like the next rung. And then if you're in that you know uh, area where it's like, you are sound asleep, a tornado could hit the house and you wouldn't know you're just sawing logs. That's like the, the next level or the, or the last rung, so to speak. And each one of these rungs correspond to a cycles per second or to a brain wave cycle. And I don't have my paperwork in front of me because um, I don't have this stuff memorized. But I know that as the cycles per second slow, so does your processing. And so when you're wide awake, multitasking, that's the highest cycles per second. And when you're asleep and you know nothing's bothering you, that's the lowest cycles per second. When you are in that dreamy state, that is a place where is a good place for remote viewing because you still need to have a foot here because you have a handler who's saying, okay, I need you to go to these coordinates or I need you to find this thing. So not when I'm dead, like when I sleep, I am dead asleep. Like you said, the tornado could, could hit the house. So that's when you can't do remote viewing because you still need to kind of be in between. Is that what you're saying? Yes. For remote, for remote viewing and for astral projection, you need to be not that low. Again, this is, okay. this is based upon my experiences and the things that I've read. There may be exceptions to that rule. I don't believe in absolutes. I absolutely don't believe in absolutes. <laughs> so when you're in that place where you're kind of groggy and, and it's, and I compare it to, it's like a late night conversation with your friends or, you know, that, that 2 AM conversation at college when, you know, everyone's half drunk. But when you have that kind of groggy speech and I'm like, okay, uh, I lost my wallet last week. I want you to go find my wallet. And the person who's doing the outbounding or the, the remote viewer, there's like, mm, okay. It's like, so I want you to go into my wallet. I want you to be my wallet. And then I want you to tell me what, what senses, what things come to mind. You know, like, what do you see? What do you feel? What do you smell? What is in that? And so that's when you get this remote viewing and they start sensing the things that are around that. The next level of that would be astral projection. You are no longer with a foot here in this world. You're technically asleep with, you know, air quotes. Some people might call this um, uh, active dreaming um, or it remote viewing, not remote viewing, uh, astral projection. The difference is, is again, you don't have a foothold here and this is all self-driven. So you can still do the same thing. If I told you while you're awake, Hey, I lost my wallet. Can you go find it for me? Then so you do the same thing, but you're doing it on your own. And, and so I started doing astral projection before I started doing remote viewing even though my first introduction was through remote viewing at 14, I found a book called far journeys by Robert Monroe. And he talks about his out of body experiences and doing astral projection. So I read this book, not so much as, Hey, here's my experiences. I read it as like a how to guide. And so like, here I am this Indiana farm boy <laughs> and my closest neighbor is a field of horses across the street. I'm like, okay, well, I don't feel like going out and tipping horses or playing mailbox baseball. So let's try this. And so it's like, I wonder what grandma and grandpa are up to. I wonder what my cousins are up to. I wonder what my friends are up to. And so I would, I called it bouncing. So I would just bounce to those places and I'd pop in. I'd be there for, you know, a few seconds and then I'd pop back. 
and that was the process. So with your out of body experiences, it's that whole rung the, or the whole ladder itself, but you can train yourself to find those rungs because so many people, you know, when they hop in bed and turn off the light, it's like, okay, I'm going to sleep. And so that's just a straight path. But what I was doing initially was I would set my alarm for like 15 minutes. And so I would try to find that projected place and I'd end up just falling asleep and the alarm would wake me up. And so I come back and it took me a few times, but eventually I found out that I could slow down that process of falling asleep. Plus kind of knowing that that alarm was going to go off in 15 minutes in the back of my mind, it kind of helped me to keep a foot here. And so that's how I kind of like slowed down that process or, you know, added more rungs to the ladder, so to speak. So my remote viewing started in the here and now. Then it was like, I wonder what this place looked like in the past. And so, you know, what does my neighborhood look like a hundred years ago? And then I went to famous places or places I had been before. I wonder what the Eiffel Tower looked like a hundred years ago. I wonder what the Statue of Liberty looked like a hundred years ago. And so then I started playing with the past. Then I discovered in remote viewing that that's one of the things you do. You, you set up an X, Y, Z coordinate system, but you also need to tell the viewer a time frame because time does not exist in that dimension. And so you have to specify, otherwise you say, go to these coordinates and you may see something that will be there in a hundred years or was there a hundred years ago or what it looked like two months ago or what it looked like right now. So I started going places and then I got the bright idea of, I wonder what's on the moon. So I went to the moon and saw what basically looked like a space junkyard. And I'm looking at all these beat up buildings and, and beat up crafts and things that look like that, you know, they've been there for, you know, eons, um, you know, covered with dust and, you know, again, it just kind of looked like a junkyard. So I kept jumping to the moon and going different places on the moon surface and looking around and, you know, oh, someone said that there's supposed to be a, uh, a spire here, or there's uh, uh, an obelisk, uh, or there's pyramids. Well, let me see those things. And so I would go there and I would see those things. And again, same type of thing. They're all beat to hell and fallen over. And, and just, it looked like it was something from a long time ago. Well, one time I said, I want to go to the moon and I want to see something interesting. And so I found myself not on the moon, but in the moon. I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. I wonder what this is. And so the best way I can com uh, compare it to is that it looked like something from Star Wars. Uh, it looked like a, uh, a, a rebel hangar. Uh, it was dirty and kind of beat up and, you know, had different colors on the walls and on the floor, kind of like a, a modern day type, you know, carrier type thing. You know, it's like if you want to go to a certain area, follow the yellow line. If you want to go to a certain area, follow the orange line. And so these lines were all gathered in front of me, but they all took off in different directions. But this is probably as big as, you know, maybe a baseball stadium as far as, you know, area. Uh, and again, you had kind of like a straight shot down the middle and you had different craft uh, on either side. Same type of thing. They were all old and, and beat up and, and uh, scarred and, uh, and they weren't uniform either. It wasn't like, you know, an F-150 all the way down. It was, you know, uh, a Yugo and a Pinto and, uh, you know, a Mazda. And they were just all different weird things. And I was like fascinated. It's like, oh my God, this is, it's a used car lot for spaceships. And so I'm looking at it all and like trying to take it in and, oh man, I want to make sure I remember this. Maybe I can draw it when I get back home. And so as I'm looking at all these ships and kind of going around and I see something that looks vaguely like a, uh, the 1960s uh, Star Trek uh, space shuttle. And so I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. So I go around the corner and I'm looking at it and looking at the pods and it's like, 
man, I wonder if the people from Star Trek knew about this and that's why they drew this up and, and, you know, come around the corner and there's a thing there. And I have to kind of pause for a second because when, when I was bouncing to different places, the only thing that ever noticed me were animals. People. Ne- that's, that's what I was, that's what I was wondering. I was going to ask, cause it sounds so cool if, if you were interacting with the space. Yeah. So people could never interact with me. They never saw me, but I did notice that when I was in certain places and moving around and checking out different things that every once in a while, a dog or a cat would look my direction. And so I'm like, huh, I guess it is true that animals can see in different spectrums. But I mean, I never had a dog like jump up and bark. I never had a cat run away, but they all just kind of looked my direction. Like they knew something was there, but again, they didn't have a startle reflex. It was more like, Hey, what's that? So anyway, so I come around the corner and I see this thing. And again, I'm kind of like startled, but again, I'm still in that space of, wow, this is all cool. Cause again, I had that fearlessness that it kind of built up because no one could see me. But this thing saw me because it had a startle reflex. And then I had a startle reflex because it saw me. And, you know, here's where the thing, if you've been with me this far, here's where I'm going to lose people. It was a friggin' reptilian. And I know people are like, okay, he's had the Kool-Aid. You're going to check out now. And okay, fine. Check out. But it's what I saw. I mean, the thing was probably eight foot tall and it had the, you know, the, what they call it, the star figure, you know, two legs, two arms and a head. Um, but I mean, it was super muscular and big and it had like a whitish creamish colored, uh, jumpsuit. Um, like a, a air force pilot or like a pilot would wear, but it was skin tight, like Lycra. Um, and it had a couple like, um, bandings on it, like a, a red and a gold, uh, trim on it. And I don't know if that was just to designate a rank or, uh, whether it was just artwork. I don't know, but it turned around and and it, its eyes got really wide and the slots of its eyes opened up really wide and then slowly started to narrow. And I'm looking at this thing and it's like, not only did I see it startle, but I felt the energy of its startle reflex. And so we both looked at each other. We both had that startle reflex. And then the next thing I got from it was again, a telepathic what are you doing here? Humans aren't supposed to be here. And then my response was, holy shit, you can see me. (laughs) And then I bolted. And as I left, I could feel it behind me. And in a previous thing I was doing, I was ghost hunting in a house that had been previously used in the underground railroad and some people died in the basement because they knocked over a lantern. It caught some things on fire down there and most of them that dying from smoke inhalation, but a couple were burned. And when I came up out of that place in my physical body, they followed me and I got in my car and they followed me. And I'm literally driving down the road at a high rate of speed (laughs) with the windows down because I can smell the fire and the burning flesh and I can still hear them. And it was almost two blocks away before I lost them. And so as I'm leaving, I'm having that same kind of feeling of being pursued And so while I'm being pursued, it's like, I don't want to bounce right back to my home. I don't want you to know where I'm at. So instead of bouncing right back home, I went through something I thought would be discouraging. And so I went through the sun 
and then kind of ricocheted around and then came back home. This thing decided not to go through the sun, but went around it. And in that detour, it lost me because as soon as I came out the other side, I didn't feel that energy anymore of being pursued. And then that's when I woke up at home with, you know, my typical like startle reflex. Like you have a bad dream and you kind of jolt yourself awake. You know, that's, and you then decided not to do remote viewing anymore. I decided not to do remote viewing anymore. And that lasted about three months. My, my, cur- my What was it? Okay. I'm sorry. Why did you believe at that time? I mean, I, I think I understand, but why did you believe in a, in an instant that the sun going through the sun would be something that the reptilian would not want to do? I don't know. So it was just lucky. It, it was an, yeah. I mean, it was an instantaneous thing. I mean, again, my thought was I'm being pursued. I don't want to be pursued. How do I shake it? Go through the sun. And I can't tell you if that's something that I thought, or I can't tell you if maybe I was being monitored and someone put that thought in my head or if I had a guardian angel mm-hmm. that was flying with me and it's like, Oh shit, dude, just go through the sun. Um, again, when I, in, in my various things that I do, some things pop up to offer assistance or I will ask for assistance and things pop up. And sometimes they're like an ancestral energy Sometimes they're more uh, elevated, but still kind of ancestral. Like I would maybe put them into the ascended master box, something that's been human. Uh, sometimes it's more of an angelic realm, which is like you, you, you're, you've never been human, but you sympathize with humans. And so there's, there's a whole, um, menagerie of, of things that kind of show up and it depends on, you know, am I doing Reiki or am I healing or am I outbounding or am I, you know, you know, trying to explore something that I shouldn't be or that other things don't want me to see, um, you know, different things will show up. But again, this was probably when I was, I'm going to say 15, I wasn't driving yet. So I'm going to think this is probably 15. So, so is this something you teach or can teach, or you mentioned that book earlier? Is that a, is that a how to, I, I am a total history nerd. I'm actually wearing a shirt that says the words history nerd on it. (laughs) And when you said you were like going back in time to see what, you know, these places look like, you you know, a hundred years ago, I mean, that is something any historian would, would love to do. And I would, I mean, that would, that would be so cool to me to go back and see moments, moments in time and places in time. Is this something that can be learned? Uh, absolutely. And because of your predilection for history, I would say, uh, start connecting with, uh, Emmanuel Swedeborg. What's that? Uh, Emmanuel Swedeborg is one of those guys that just basically shit science. Oh, uh, he's one of those, you know, 1700s guys is like, he's a politician. He's a historian. He's a scientist. He's, he's one of those everything dudes. I thought, so it's a person. When you said it, I thought you said Emmanuel Swedish. Board yeah. I thought it was like, a, like some sort of Ouija board. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I thought too. Yeah. You want to get a Swedish board? <laughs> so it's a person. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, you're holding a class on the 21st, 20th, 21st, somewhere around there? Uh, 20, Saturday the 22nd. Oh, 22nd. Uh, yeah, so I, I joined a group here locally that uh, is like a CE5 group. And these, these people seem to be a little more grounded than some other folks that, you know, I've talked to. Um, so I, I have a good energy with them and, uh, they're kind of like me. The, the way I describe myself is there is a saying that's attributed to Mark Twain. Uh, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. 
And so I have this clinical trial background and, I, and you know, I'm, I'm most comfortable in my left brain when I see evidence-based practice, but I also have enough life experience to know that some shit is true, even if I can't prove it. And maybe I just don't have the, the capacity to do that. It's like in physics lab, I did really good work, but in physics class, I sucked. So there's just some things I'm good at and some things I'm not. Well, it would blow my mind if Brian was actually remote viewing. <laughs> I'll just say that much. It's worth a shot. <laughs> that would be, yeah, that would be very interesting. Brian, would I, would I be correct in kind of assuming you kind of are from Missouri in the sense it's the show me state? You got to tear yeah, absolutely. it Absolutely. We've talked, together. yeah, we've talked about that a number of times on the show. Mm-hmm. Okay. So again, I grew up an Indiana farm boy and you never throw anything away. Everything can be repurposed. Mm -hmm. Uh, my grandfather was my babysitter growing up, a child of the depression. So again, I come from a very level headed, um, physical grounded. Right. Very similar. Where where in Indiana are you from? Uh, I grew up in Brownsburg, Indiana, which is a little Northwest of uh, Indianapolis. Uh, mm-hmm. went, I know it went to Purdue for a couple of years. Uh, oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Uh, but I ended up working a couple. I went to ball. I went to ball state. Uh, I'd rather I you than ball you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, hey, David Letterman went to ball state and I uh, was going to do graduate Indeed. work at ball state. So it's just an old joke. But the way, the way I came about it from my way of thinking was, if these people in history who I held in high regard, like Washington and Franklin and Jefferson, mm-hmm. um, if these guys actually had mentioned in their personal diaries and letters about receiving information from outside themselves, then it has to be true. Because in my mind, these guys didn't lie. And so that research then right. later on took me to Emanuel Swedeborg. And again, he's one of their contemporaries from Europe. And he would have, let's put it this way, there is a lot more information about consciousness and communing with things that are also consciousness that don't necessarily reside here and now that he was connecting with. Um, some would say that I think it's John D who was, um, um, I forget what his title was, but for queen Elizabeth, he was like the master spy slash scientist slash, uh, you know, wisdom keeper. He also was doing some of this work and arguably some of the people who were part of the original Illuminati were these folks to, to illuminate themselves, to grasp a higher knowledge and to integrate it into our reality. That was the original intent of the Illuminati until it got exploited. So going back to those gentlemen who I held in high esteem and seeing how they were getting that information was what caught my attention. But then to see other people who were unfairly treated by history like Tesla and see how they were also getting that same information. It was like, there must be something true here. Otherwise it wouldn't show up as many times and looking at the caliber of the people with whom it was showing up, it, it just, it was like gnawing at my brain. I couldn't let it go. And so that's when I started, okay, well, if these guys can do it, I can do it. Or I can at least try. And so for a while it was like, okay, I'm going to find that place where I can take off and do all these things in my mind. And then I, you know, promptly fall asleep and wake up an hour later with drool on my pillow. 
so it's like, okay, well, I got to figure this out. How do I stop that part? It's like, okay, we'll set an alarm. And so the alarm kept me from going all the way into REM. And what I didn't realize though, is that part of my brain would be like, okay, you know, that alarm's going to go off. You know, that alarm's going to go off. And so I couldn't go all the way to sleep because part of my brain was like, it's going to ring anytime now, anytime now. And so that's when I started stretching out that process of, you know, my head hits a pillow. Well, now it takes me four or five minutes. And so now, I have mm-hmm. a question. Okay, sure. If you, when, what would have happened when you had met your friend, the reptilian, if your alarm had gone off in that moment? So if my alarm had gone off in that moment, I would have snapped right back. And he would have found you? I don't know that. Was it a he or a she? Do we know? <laughs> when when you when when you're doing all these things, you know, you're you're describing a scenario that's obviously taking longer than 15 minutes. Is your alarm still getting ready to to go off? So when you're when you're remote viewing, time is because it you, you know, I mean it's quote unquote at a standstill that you're not affected by time? Uh, I'm not affected by time. I mean, my process, I don't do it every day anymore. Um, but there was a time when I was doing this daily. And so if someone said, hey, I need to go find something, you know, I could take, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes and go find it. But I would come back with more than 10 or 15 minutes of experience. Right. Interesting. But I think if you, if you want if you want to practice this, the first thing you've got to do is settle down your monkey mind or settle down the left brain part and come to that place where it's like, okay, if the people I know and respect have done this and their historical precedent, precedents for this being done, and I can see that uh, you know three letter agencies were pouring a lot of money into this process for a couple of decades, then maybe there's something to yeah, it. Yeah, but they also abandoned it, didn't they? So what does that say? Yes, they did. So the CIA started financing it in 74. They stopped in 76, but then the Air Force picked up on it. And then the Air Force decided to stop, but then the DIA picked up on it. And one of my theories is, is that if it didn't work, then agencies would stop giving them money. Or if it did work, but I want to make sure that I'm polluting the information stream. You want to publicly say this doesn't work and and stop putting money into it. That's the big picture. The small picture is that within the agencies themselves, you change where the money is coming from and you change who is involved So that again, kind of like to that Henry Ford thought process, you don't want to have one person know the whole picture. But I also think that there was some rationale in the mid nineties to stop doing that because we have drone technology now and we have satellite technology where the optics are refined enough that we don't need remote viewers in the way that we needed them back then. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, if I want to know what's going on in the Arctic Circle now, I can have a drone there in short order and I can see what's going on live with 100% accuracy. I don't need three or four different remote viewers pulling together a consortium of similar imagery and then having a basic idea of what's going on. There's no ambiguity now. And that's just what's out there in common domain. So, I mean, as far as I know, DARPA's got things out there that are size of dragonflies that are acting as drones. Um, So I think our technology has caught up to that. But I also think by taking the process private, like you said, you are no longer beholden to government uh, strictures in the sense that I can do with what I want outside because I can dump as much money in. I'm not beholden to the Freedom of Information Act. Anything I discover doesn't have to be shared. 
and it, the, the kind of a way to kind of see that pan out is that Joe McGonigal, as an example, was a remote viewer from the 70s to the 80s. And then he stopped remote viewing for the government, but continued with outside agencies, um, uh, SRI out in California. There was uh, a group of Rutgers. There was a, a group in D.C. Uh, there was the Rhine here. There were other places he was going and doing this. Um, and now he has a company that teaches remote viewing. But what he does is he mixes in remote viewing with Six Sigma and other uh, business attributes. And now it's, it's looks like as though you want to acquire, um, competitive intelligence on a business. So, you know, if I'm Coke, uh, then maybe I want to go remote view what Pepsi's up to. Hmm. So they've, 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 they've kind of spun it into that direction, at least exterior facing. But I can also tell you that I, I personally know some people who do remote viewing for a third party and they're not looking at the surface of things anymore. So there is, there are still places where drones cannot fly. Are you talking about underground? Uh, I'm talking about underground. I'm talking about off world. Yeah. Okay. Just clarifying. We're in a really, really busy neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Earth is a hot spot. It is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming back on the show and sharing all that information with us. Yeah. Do, do we actually I... cover, do we, do we actually come to any conclusions? <laughs> We 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 abhor conclusions. We don't come to them. We talk how about do, things. How dare you use that That's language in front of ladies? <laughs> hmm. No, that was great. And um, I I wish that you were having your class online because I would totally like to attend it. But um, maybe I'll remote view it. Uh, there you go. It would, it would be it would be really cool to to learn what you're gonna be putting out there on the 22nd. Wish you all the success. I'm happy that you're finally doing something that's bringing you joy. Is in this remote viewing class. I know you and I had a conversation about that back in the summer, and like that just makes me so happy to hear that you're doing that. So I think it's great, and I also think it's a really interesting topic. So I'm excited to see see the class when it's finally made available to those of us who can't be there in person. Um, for our audience, can you just let them know again where they can find you if they want to reach out to you? Sure. Uh, so I have a new website. It's uh, johnmathis.me. Uh, sounds terribly arrogant, but it's also terribly inexpensive uh, <laughs> of a URL. So it's J-O-H-N-M-A-T-H-I-S dot me. Uh, inside that umbrella, you'll find the uh, Alchemist Air book. You'll find uh, Elemental Alchemy Cream. Um, I have another book that's a manuscript that's getting ready to be published called Guitar, Cigars, and Tiki Bars, One Guy's Guide to Spirituality. Uh, and then you'll also find a, a link for classes and contact. And that's where you'll find the information for the remote viewing class. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming back on the show, John. It's always a pleasure to have you on here. Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Lisa, Brian, thank you very much. Brian, nice to meet you. Uh, hopefully we'll get together and do this yeah, again. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Yeah, good having you on again. And to our audience, uh, if you have any questions, any topic ideas, please send them into our email, info at enlightenup.us. And uh, that's it for this week. And oh yeah, if you uh, are curious, you can check out our new t-shirt store that you can access from our website. We'll leave a link in the description of this episode as well. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us this week, and we will be back with you again next week. <laughs>